Welcome back, everyone, to another episode with Andrew and Joe. This time, we're going to get together and preview this upcoming Phillies and Mets series. First off, Joe, how you doing today? Doing well, doing well. It was a busy day. I was on uh, my friend John off the wall hockey for the NHL trade, de- trade deadline. There we go. And now ready to talk some uh, Phillies baseball as we got delayed one day. But it actually was, I guess, beneficial since there was enough to watch today when it came to uh, being hockey as my other favorite sport, too. So... Um, get to watch both games tomorrow when there's not as much uh, other business going on. But it's definitely exciting to preview the series and get into previewing our two starters, which we'll get to soon. But it's nice that we did not change anything. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the shirt today. I don't know if you know, but 17 years ago today, Bobby O'Brien actually hit the first home run in Citizens Bank Park. I don't know if you knew that or not, but <laughs> there's your fun fact of the day. So nice job wearing that shirt on this fine, uh, fine Monday uh, evening here on the anniversary of that day. But uh, anyway, like you said, we got the big series here. Obviously, always going to be the best. Obviously, we before all we get fans. into it, though, I find it funny because we'll get to him pitching in game two anyway. But just that, um, it's like Steve Cohen probably came downstairs and was like, Louie, you got to pitch Marcus Stroman in soon again because he's pissed off right now. So, you know, you need to put him in a game soon again. Otherwise, he might wring someone's neck. So, oh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, it, it goes like, it's funny how he threw, um, like, Anthony DeComo, who's a Mets reporter, said Stroman threw today and told him he was good to go. So, he'll be the game two starter. Um, it's funny how quick that just developed after he tweeted, like, he wouldn't be able to throw again for five days. Um, because which was stupid, by the way, that was absolutely dumbfounding that yeah. the MLB that game. Um, but um, now he's able to go again, which I think makes logistical sense. When that happened, and like that doesn't usually happen in that oomph of a degree in a rain delay. But even if you throw like twenty pitches, if you're somebody that like normally you probably could throw the next day and then wait and then start again because like you see relievers throw twenty pitches, skip a day, throw again. If you're a starter, you're used to throwing a crap ton of pitches uh seven obviously ain't anything but i feel like it makes sense to put him back in and not wait five days i feel like that might have got him more off kilt hopefully he sucks against us but i think for the mets that made more sense than giving a five-day thing i never understood why teams do that when teams when pitchers like get in such a quick rain delay they barely have like 20 some pitches like i feel like you don't have to wait the whole five days i feel like that might throw them more off kilt but that's always just been my thought with that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think people just get worried about what I'm doing, their warm, regular warm-ups and everything and starting the whole warm-up process, throwing all those pitches, and then eventually getting back to that. So I don't know what the thought process is, but I agree. Sometimes it's weird. But, um, no, yeah, it's going to create an interesting day tomorrow. Obviously, we get some good pitching matchups. Uh, we'll get here and do it a little bit. But, obviously, again, Big series against the Mets. I know it's only April and the 10th 10, 10 through, 14, through 14th game of the year. But, hey, it's this division is going to come down to the wire. You're going to need these division games early on. So the Phillies come in at 6-3 and three, while the Mets come in at 2-3 and three, as they had a delayed start to the year when the uh, Nationals had their COVID cases and the Phillies obviously continue to play. So this is the first time the Phillies have been postponed so far this year. And we get the... Uh, First taste of the horrible new uh, doubleheader rules still, I guess not new anymore, but second year of the seven-inning doubleheaders, which will still drive me crazy. I don't know about you, your thoughts on that. Um, but, no, yeah, I, I don't like that. So let's, let's start rolling here. So first matchup, I guess it's going to be – what would you is, – is Strowman pitching game one or two? What you uh, say? Stroh's game two. MLB.com has it wrong right now. They have, if you click on the two games, nobody in game one and then Walker and Wheeler in game two. But according to DeComo, who's a Mets reporter, so I'm going to trust him since he's a Mets beach writer that he knows what he's talking about when it comes to the rotation. Um, he says Walker's going game one and Strowman's going game two. So that would mean Walker's matched up with Chase Anderson yes. and Stroh, which makes sense matchup-wise. Based on like why the hell would the Mets put Strowman with Chase Anderson when <laughs> he's yeah. clearly and you, the best? Usually, of, <laughs> yeah, usually well, Walker's the, pretty good too. But I'm saying like Stroh at his best is like one of like at times in Toronto people thought was going to be one of the better pitchers. Walker had that talked about him years ago before injury, but now it's he's a great third four as a comeback story. So uh, it makes sense the matchup the way they want it. <clears throat> Yeah, and usually you have these teams let 
about their veteran and the better pitcher pick whether he'd want the night or the day game. So I'm sure they kind of went into that a little bit as well. So we'll see what happens. But to your point, let's get into that first matchup between Chase Anderson and Marcus Stroman. Obviously, or sorry, Chase Anderson and Teron Walker. Um, obviously, Chase Anderson. I mean, we. We know what he is coming in the year. He's kind of that consistent pitcher there throughout the, uh, his time here in the MLB. And, and his first start with the Phillies was kind of an up-and-down start. I mean, overall, I think you'll take what he was able to do in that game against the Mets early on Five in this, innings, yeah. in this five year. Innings, so two runs, I'll take that. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's uh, the five runs, two innings, and eventually you go on to uh well reverse five innings two runs five the, the other would have been uh we probably would have been calling him the new vince velasquez if it was five runs and two innings well, i said five innings two runs no yeah. no you said five runs yeah. and two in. yeah that's I, right. you have five. vince velasquez on your mind probably because he was projected to maybe be put in uh if uh, we can go with chase anderson tomorrow so <laughs> Yeah, it was it was Vince Velasquez that came in and ruined that start, honestly. Um, but anyway, Chase Anderson, again, five innings, two runs, three strikeouts, allowing two hits in those five innings. It's not bad at all. He went up against Marcus Stroman in that first game. Obviously won't be in this game, as we just mentioned. So, I mean, what did you see out of Chase Anderson in your first start? Are you excited to watch him again? And what do you think he'll be able to do? Are you just looking for five innings from him and turn it over to that bullpen? Or what, what are you looking for in this outing? Well, I think uh, Anderson's a guy that you're going to usually get about five or six out of, and that's the max. You're going to give up two to four runs a game, probably more like three to four usually, but giving up two, uh, that's just what a normally a three and four starter is. But uh, he came out and obviously pitched better than more this far early. He looks a little uh, shaky. So I think he looks good. His career ERA, like I said uh, in one of our opening videos prior to the season, is a 406 and a 127 whip. So that's pretty good for a 4 or 5 um, starter. So I think he's going to be that consistent, keeps you in games, um, 4 or 5 starter, where Walker um, probably has that more like comeback peak potential, like I said, where he can be that 3 four swing guy on a comeback story. Um, so, but I think it's a good pitching matchup. I feel like this is going to be a good close game where he'll give up two to three in uh, five or six innings of work and keep the Phillies in the game, depending where their offense is at at that point, whatever the score would be, but giving up two to three runs from a guy like him, uh, even four in like six innings of work is not bad at all because that just keeps you in the game and that's all you had. Of your fourth or fifth starter, I do think a point that needs to be brought up, though, that Ricky brought up uh, before they when they said the rain delay came on when they went to Barkan and Ricky, since they were just sitting in the studio anyway, um, <laughs> which was um, that the bullpen actually has probably helped, even though we have 27 games in 27 days now, the bullpen was used a lot recently. So if you can have two seven inning games, yeah, that rule's not too sexy, but for the Phillies, it might be. And here's the reason nah. why the bullpen is already in, in not the best of shape having to be used because of starters not going deep, including Wheeler and Nola in their last start. So if that's that gives them an extra day's rest, seven innings, if Nola, who will get too soon, can actually pitch six of the seven, then you only have a reliever going one inning. If he can pitch seven, fantastic. And then if um, Chase Anderson can pitch five, we have to remember that's pretty much pitching to the eighth inning in uh, the game tomorrow because we're playing a seven inning game. So if he can pitch five, we're sitting pretty and only using a reliever two innings. If he can pitch six, we're sitting real pretty. So I think that kind of does help their bullpen. I get what Ricky said. I don't love it switching to the college rule, but for the Phillies, it might benefit them now just like the uh, extra innings rule actually ended up benefiting them that I don't love either and Girardi doesn't like, but even admitted it benefited them the other day. So this this rule probably will also benefit them, albeit I don't think anyone really likes it. But Yeah, we'll see what happens. And it's obviously, like you said, there are pros and cons to everything. Uh, for most things you look at in life in general. So, I mean, obviously this will come with that. But let's talk about Chase Anderson's counterpart before we kind of get into the offense and what we expect. But uh, Teron Walker in his first outing this year was, I mean, it gave him a quality start. His command wasn't fully there with two walks, uh, four hits and six innings. That's six six base runners there. But he gave up two runs uh, in those six innings, quality start. 
four strikeouts. What do you what do you kind of expect the Phillies' approach to be against him? And, and who do you think, as we uh, close out these two starting pitchers, who do you think has the starting pitching edge in this game between Walker and Anderson? I would say um, with Taiwan Walker's bounce back year, he has a slight um, edge just because for his career, he obviously also, similar to Stroh, was once regarded as a highly touted, where Anderson was always that battle to become a starter in the league and then uh, really battle to become stay in the league type guy. So I think they got the little advantage there. But I mean, I think we saw from Chase Anderson in his first game and in his uh, spring training how much of a competitor he is. So I think they have the advantage. But like I said, he'll give up three to four, keep them in the game. And then you just have to have the bat swinging against Walker, where I think your approach has to be. He's one of those pitchers. Um, he's not obviously when at, pitching at his best like he did at times last year, then yeah, he did look like he could be potentially top notch caliber, but that's not really where Taiwan Walker is anymore. But he is one of those guys that will go easily through five, easily through six, if you don't get him in the first two. So I think your approach to Walker has to be get him in the first couple innings. He's not one of those three, four starters that usually all of a sudden has a middle third or fourth inning where like Kyle Kendrick, for example, uh, where he just uh, completely explodes and you're just like about to be Vince Lombardi. Like, what the hell is going on out here? <laughs> like, uh, so I think uh, he's a guy, 383 career ERA, the 1.244 whip. So that's obviously a little bit better than Anderson there. Um, he's a guy that's, again, a high compete, but has some nasty stuff. Um, good for him to have the comeback train. He started in Toronto, but it's sad and upsetting. Uh, that comeback train continues with the match, and he's probably going to kick our behinds in some games. But uh, hopefully tomorrow's not one of them. I think we'll stay in the game because I think Anderson will also pitch well. I think this will end up being a good pitcher's game in this game where both of the guys will attack. And if the teams don't get to them enough in the first two innings, they'll be able to go at least depending what the teams want because in these seven-inning games, we've seen guys come out after four because it's almost like it's the like seventh inning at that point. Um, so, um, it's, it's different in this, in this type of format. Um, but I, if they, they could definitely go at least four, both of those guys are four and two thirds, whatever the teams want out of them. And I think it makes more sense if they're pitching, well, let both of them go five innings. So you preserve your bullpen to, to don't start doing all that analytical BS that you just like, well, why seven innings? So, blah, 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 blah. it's like, no, if they're going well, just let them keep pitching. So, um, I that's always my approach on it, but I think it's going to be great starts for both. But you got to attack Walker early. He showed that in Toronto last year. Hell, he had a 1.37 ERA, so he bounced back to the old guy last year. But I don't think he'll stay with that because if you look at some of his uh, underlining numbers, they're a little bit higher. He'll probably be more like a high two to a mid three um, guy or now. But I think he's going to have a good season. That's why you got to attack him early. He showed last year don't attack him early you're screwed so get get a couple of those runs um try to make it be if he gives up three like a three three game or like a three two game by the time marker comes out because the Mets do have some guys like Montero and other um that can lose control they have very nasty stuff out of the bullpen but some guys that can lose the zone and then you can uh get some runs going against if you can get into their bullpen at a, at a close game, you can't get into the bullpen at four nothing. So if you can get into a bullpen at a close game, you you would have a good chance of coming back four nothing. You really have to have a guy lose control and leave one over for you to get a bunch of guys on base via walks and then slam one out of the park. So I think you got to the offense has to stay because I think Anderson will with this offense of the Mets give up three to four, but keep the offense in it. Um, with hitting Walker and this will be a good game. I think down to the bitter end. Of seven innings, <laughs> I would yeah. pre- I would predict we'll win. I guess four to three because I feel like Anderson's going to give up three, so maybe he'll come out with a tie or us down three to two or something like that, and then the, we'll be able to uh, get a four to three uh, win in the first game. Yeah, and for, for those who don't know, Tom Walker, his numbers against the Phillies. Phillies are hitting two seventy six against them overall, uh, in forty three at bats, eleven hits. Four doubles. Listen to this, and you know Joe Girardi likes giving guys um, 
likes giving guys days off and, and here and there. We saw it last year. We've already seen it this year. Ronald Torres, he's three for three off uh, Teron Walker with two doubles. So it'll be interesting to see just reading that and looking at numbers that we'll see if he's a he'll be a start there in that opening game, just giving somebody some type of rest for a double header with those kind of numbers. And the other guy that's hitting pretty well off him is uh, Didi Gregorius, uh, three for nine. Uh, with hitting 333 off him with an RBI as well. Nobody's hit a home run off him um, in the Phillies lineup so far. Outside of that, the numbers are kind of iffy, so we won't go through all of them. But I agree. I think the Phillies can go out and win this game, and I think Chase Anderson will put you in a position to win, and you'll probably look to use some of your relievers in game one here. Obviously, expecting Nola to go out and pitch pretty well in game two. So I ex- kind of expect to see it more of a bullpen-type game with, like you said, Anderson going four or five and then turning it over. And so we'll see what happens. Uh, but but yeah. moving on. Although five wouldn't be a bullpen game in this game, though, because it's only seven innings. So you're really taking a guy out. And like I said, you're taking a guy out. And yeah, but you're putting, still, so. I think it's still considered a bullpen game. But uh, moving on to uh, game two there for the nightcap of that doubleheader. We'll see when it gets started. The first game is scheduled for 410 Eastern time. So you figure what seven inning game would probably be around two and a half hours if I had to guess. So you're looking at the second game, probably about seven ten to seven thirty. Which That's in reality, the earliest it can start. Too. In reality, it's a normal start there. You'd think expect a little bit around there, but uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, for game two, Marcus Stroman is going to get the nod for the Mets for the Philadelphia Phillies. Of course, it's going to be Aaron Nola, as he's also mentioned. And let me just ask you this: What what does Nola have to do to have a bat, bounce back out? Uh, just to have better control. Like in his first start, he controlled the zone very well and came out just like Wheeler did, uh, who we'll get to soon. Um, but th- he controlled the zone and came out really well where he was battling through it and was able to battle through it. But that's not what you want to see, especially in a seven inning game. Uh, you're hoping he's the starter that's able to pitch at least over five, like in somewhere into the sixth inning, I think you would hope. Uh, in that seven inning game, so you're barely using the bullpen, and maybe even using if you bring in a Kinsler or a uh, or a um, Nearest or a um, Coonrod or somebody. We've seen those Alvarado. guys, Alvarado, that all have closing experience. Other than I don't think Alvarado's won a couple innings yet, but we, maybe he did once. But we've seen a lot of those guys go a couple innings. Um, so you can have a guy get probably four outs. I mean, we've already seen him multiple times. So if Noah can just pitch into that six innings, I think that's what's pivotal in that second game. Just get him somewhere into that six and get at least one or two outs. And then you might even be able to just ride the same guy uh, for the rest of the outs. And then you're really sitting pretty if uh, Anderson goes four and some change or five total innings. You only use two guys, hopefully, maybe even one pitches two innings in the first game. That would be lovely. And then um, you would have in the second game only have to use potentially one guy if Noah goes into the six innings. So I think that's the key. The bi- the bigger key is, though, you can't let Stroh do the same thing because this has the potential to be a game that's like nothing, nothing, 1-1 one, one, as both guys come out in the sixth inning just because of how good Strowman's control looked as soon as he came back in. Obviously, you can't judge anything off of seven pitches. So in his first start... Um, and then, uh, how good Noah looked in his first start, he battled through his second. You're not used to seeing him at back-to-back bad starts. So I see him bouncing back. It seems like Stroman's really giddy, giddy this year and looking good. So, uh, I would expect that. I would honestly not be surprised if it's what I just said, nothing, nothing game or a one, one game. Um, when both of these guys come out, because I see both of them, especially when some guys are in two games, this is their second game of the day, they're hitting a little bit more tired. These are guys coming in, uh, throwing after not participating in the first game. Uh, I think they're going to fare pretty well against the lineup, so they both pitch a very good game. Yeah, and here's the problem. I just looked looking at the numbers. Um, Marcus Stroman's basically the opposite of what we just talked about, Walker. Uh, Phillies are hitting... 192 against Marcus Stroman. Nobody's really got good numbers. Gregorius, 9 of 34, 265 average. is honestly one of the highest, but you go to Hoskins, he's 1 for 6. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon's 1 for 2, so I guess batting average-wise, that's the highest, but very minimal yeah. at bats. Um, you look to the bench, maybe giving guys off, but Brad Miller, 7 for seven for 34. Ronald Torres, 0 for 8. Uh, so Gene Segura with 
16 at bats is probably the best hitting 313 with five hits in there jt's also hit 500 four for eight so we'll see what happens there um but it's gonna be a very tough outing there and like you said i expect a full pitching duel between marcus stroman and aaron nola and i, I expect nola to be bounced back outing here and obviously like we talked about last time in our post game Nola threw well last game in terms of finding ways to get out of jams against the Mets. Like, hey, he only lasted four innings, but he didn't give up runs, uh, a lot of runs. Like, he found ways to get and out of innings. And the one was bases loaded, if thing. I remember correctly, when he got out of it um, in the fourth uh, to, to then come out of the game afterwards. But, yeah, I mean, he battled through that. Um, I think you're going to see him, like I said, have a good bounce-back game, and the Strom is just going to be what he normally is, pitch a good game himself, and that'll be whoever's bullpen uh, screws them over. Um, is going to, which is not even going to be totally screws him over. At least one mistake pitch uh, probably loses that game because if it's nothing, nothing, one, one, you're not screwing him over. It's just one mistake pitch. And unfortunately, uh, you're the scapegoat for that day. But um, <laughs> that's uh, probably what's going to happen in game two, I would think. So I wouldn't even predict that game because I think that game's such a toss uh, when it comes to both those guys going against each other on the mound and in a, such a seven inning unique type of format. Yeah, and that's where it's going to keep going. And we'll move into game three here. Um, and you have Zach Wheeler, and I don't know, maybe you have something different, but as of now, Mets have not announced anyone. Again, obviously. Uh, Anthony DeCuomo said Wednesday would be um, David Peterson. Okay, so a guy that Phillies lit up the first time they played him this year. Um, two, I think it was, that was a game with two, three run home runs. You, you win eight, two. Mm -hmm. I think Pearson gave up six or seven in the game. So, obviously, again, very favorable matchup for the Phillies there between Zach Wheeler and uh, Peterson. Obviously, one, you're going to tip the hat to the Phillies. The Mets don't do good at CVP. We saw, I think you were at the game with me when Steven Match got lit. Um, oh, yeah. And then... Uh, well, that's, yeah, got we just got a lot of left-handed killers. I mean, you look at our lineup, like Harper can hit lefties. Reese Hoskins is probably one of the best left-handed hitting players and in the league. he's not too savvy at hitting. Yeah. Himself. JT... JT's obviously going to hit left pretty well, so we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm excited to see this series because I think the way the Mets season has been delayed a little bit, the way they've got postponed games and stuff, I think the pitching matchups have now favored the Phillies. Obviously, no matter who you throw up against there, Jacob DeGrom's going to have the edge. But outside of that, I think the Phillies have the edge in every other game if you're just looking at pure starting pitcher, and I truly mean that. And I think when you turn to the back so end of the bullpen— you think they have the edge of Walker to Anderson? I think, like you said, it's pretty close. But in the end, top to bottom, pitching-wise, I'm going to lean towards the Phillies, I think, just with the way the bullpen's been pitching well. Um, I think top to bottom, the pitching's going to lean uh, lean our way. So we'll, we'll see what happens in that sense. But uh, I'm excited to see where this goes. Zach Wheeler, again, he should have the edge over a David Peterson, a guy we've lit up uh, before four innings, six runs given up in that inning. So we'll see what he's able to do when the time comes in that game. So – I mean, unless you have a lot on that third game. We, we I'm just really... need wheels to bounce back, just like Noah. It's the same take as Noah. That's why we don't have – I mean, there's not a lot much more to say other than he had the great control in game one, just like Noah's not so much in game two. Uh, come back and uh, show your best stuff again. You're not used to seeing either of those guys at back-to-back off starts, especially since coming to Philly for uh, wheels uh, since last year. So I expect him to bounce back. And that one, yeah, I agree with you. That one should favor the Phillies uh, when it comes to pitching matchup for sure, especially with Peterson uh, as a young kid. I'm sure um, that might play into your psyche a little bit more as a young kid playing against the team right away that just torched you the week before. And now you're going up against in your hometown against the Mets fans that are obviously just like us, not the most civil if you shock. Um when uh, you just struggled last week against the Phillies. So I don't know how easy that is for a guy that still is considered a rookie because he also, I don't think, met the requirements. So he, along with the Rosarina and others, can still technically uh, win <laughs> the, the, the rookie of the year. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, it's going to be a game that Wheeler really takes advantage of him and pitches well, hopefully – because this actually is not a seven inning game. He can go about six and two thirds or seven innings in this game. And then you still have the bullpen continue to be set in good order because we don't want to have any games early in this 27 for 27 stretch that your bullpen just gets 
torched for having to be used because someone gets lit up early because that's just going to affect you from the jump when it comes to having to play all these games in this just sort of a run. Yeah, with that question, and that's where it's going to become intriguing. What what's going to happen down the stretch when these these games do collide? And, and I think this last game of the series is where my big attention goes to because obviously you're already once able to scrap out a win when Degrom threw against you. Yeah, we didn't beat him. I think he threw six scoreless before they removed him from the game. But I think you just got to do the same thing in that style, and that's going to be work the at bats, force him to throw a lot, and then force him out of the game. And Zach Eflin, as we know, and we both agree, he's no joke, especially with the way he's kind of turned it on since the pitching coach issues. And that's a day game, 12-10 in the afternoon, or – yeah, I think it's 12, 10 in the afternoon, mm-hmm. sorry. Living in the Central Time sometimes throw me off, and I kind of mix it up. But no, it is 12, 10 Eastern Time. So we'll see what Zach Eflin's able to do, and I think it's going to be a battle. I mean, not many Mets hitters hit Eflin well. He's thrown very well against them as well. Uh, I mean, you look at guys like Michael Conforto, he's hitting 269 against him in 26 at-bats, which isn't that good. It will be interesting to see. He's never faced the two big hitters in that lineup in Francisco Lindor and James McCann, so we'll see where he fares against that. Believe it or not, Kevin Pillar sent 500 against Zach Eflin, so that's that's been the big guy six, there. Eight, yeah, Kevin yeah, Pillar, the guy that I wanted in the offseason. Now he's on the match, you know. Always <laughs> ends up, it always ends up that way. The guy, yeah. some of the little guys you want Him to and Walker. in the offseason go to the, uh, yeah, go to the um, rivals. But yeah, I mean, you figure that's the game. It's going to be an afternoon game. So you put the uh, Jacob the Grom killer in, Andrew Knapp, hitting 444 <laughs> off the Grom. So I'm um, assuming we'll see, see him in there. Well, he will probably but, be in two games in this series then because I highly doubt JT's catching 14 innings straight. On um tomorrow, hey, it's JT. I put a pass and do anything, but no, I, I would have nap- passed him to do it. It's just your manager's a catcher, so I would definitely put it past Girardi to put a catcher in for back to back games, just knowing the role of a catcher himself when it comes to uh how much of a, especially when you're playing 27 and 27, yeah. unless if you want Nap to play 12 of those 27 games. Uh, you probably don't want to tax JT too much early. So if you're Sean, then you're like, oh, yeah, completely. Just let JT just play him in both games. It doesn't matter. We have Andrew Knapp. He can play 15 of the 20, whatever game. But if you're not Sean from uh, Always Next Year podcast, then you probably want JT to play a good handful of those 27 games. Okay. No, you're not wrong there. Um, but I, we'll see what's able to happen. Uh, I would say let's turn to the offense for a little bit as we went through those matchups again. I believe the Phillies have the advantage in three of those four pitching matchups. We'll see if that comes to fruition or not. Um, Bork, real quick, in just a short number, what what did you say out of the four starters pitching matchups? How many Phillies favor the Phillies? Um, the first one's close. I don't know if I would say it favors the Phillies, but definitely the Peterson to Walker one does, and then the Noah and Stroh. That would favor the Phillies, um, but I think that one's going to be a pitcher's duel. So I would say it's either split or um, basically split with one being even. So it depends how you want to throw that up when it comes to Anderson and uh, Walker because his numbers for Anderson are a lot better when you look at some of his inner numbers when it – uh, comes to whip and like walks and hits per like innings pitch stats. Some of the inner analytical um stats of like contact, like Rady has contact percent, like all that crap. Um, he has pretty good numbers with that for um all that and ground ball outs and all that. So I think um he's one of those underrated late inning or not late inning um late rotation uh pieces that can give you innings. That's why I was thinking of innings um in your rotation. So. Um, I feel like he's good, and then you're going to have all these other guys step up and pitch like we always expect them to uh, in these series because they're your main horses um, in the rest of the series in the Eflins, Nolas, and the Wheelers. So. Yeah, without question. Uh, let's turn to the offense for a little bit. We, we hit close to the half-hour mark. Let's, what is that? Finish. <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's turn that to the offense, as Joe just said. As we uh, get to the half hour mark to wrap this show up, uh, two quick questions about this offense. One, what do you look forward to in this series uh, overall, top to bottom? I mean, do you think they're going to continue to hit well like they did towards the end of that Atlanta series? Do you think it's going to be a mi- mixed match? Obviously, DeGrom is going to be tough, but the, fairly with the other guys, where do you see? And um, what do you look for uh, to see kind of approach wise from this team? Um, 
Well, what I'm looking for is guys to continue to go uh, with their pitches that I've been seeing a lot better this year rather than a lot of guys getting pool happy we saw uh, with this team, including Reese Hoskins, who's hitting the ball over the plate um, and is still seeing, they said, a good amount of pitches, just like six-something pitches per at-bat, I believe they said on the telecast. But uh, nobody's complaining about that anymore because he's having a Joey Votto as season of when Joey Votto uh, was on pace to be one of the MVP contenders. But it's it generally, so I'm not saying Reese is going to be on pace for that. But uh, he's getting the hits going now. He's going to all fields. He has an above 940 OPS. He's just hitting it where it goes. And I like how Bohm now, it seemed like in that last series, he was a guy at the end of the Atlanta series. You talked about uh, the offense getting hot. He was one that brought us up. He was struggling a bit to 235 now. So if he has a good series in this series, he'll be right back up in the uh, high 250s, 260s, something along that order, and keep bringing his thing up. I also like how he has two store bases already, which is a nice thing uh, to, right. to, add, to add into him. So, but uh, he's a guy that hits it around all fields. I like how that approach is uh, really hitting home to guys finally, where for some reason before everybody just kept trying to hit it to their pool side and hit it into shifts. Well, now JT too, uh, where he obviously was always pretty good at hitting it against the ship, but even now always seems to when for some reason the Braves put that stupid shift on him all the way to the left, uh, that he can always somehow now automatically hit it to right field in most of those at-bats. So it seems like the hitting coach is doing a very uh, keen job with those guys. John Maley, right? That's his name, I think. I was blanking. Yes. In my, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Sure. John, good. what did you say? What were you, what were you saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he said like Maley's just doing a good job with these hitters to get them to just have their swings and not what the old regimen was, which was everybody have the same exact swing because you're all the same exact person. And it's like, no, that's not – how it is actually um but i think this is starting to work better i like how guys are starting to hit Torres. we haven't even seen enough of the judge so i can't really say anything on ronald Torres. uh but i also like how cuts put a couple nicer swings on at the end of that series he's a guy struggling big time at 179 but hitting some balls harder at the end of that series even when he got out so i would like to see him continue to have those good hard hit balls that hopefully eventually become gap doubles and he continues to uh, kind of get his swing back in order there. Yeah, real quick, I was actually wrong. It's not John Malley. He was the former uh, coach. It's not Joe Dillon. Oh, Joe Dillon. That's right. The John guy Malley. Yeah, John. Th- yeah, John Malley was the one that ended up screwing up everyone's yeah. swing. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. He's the <laughs> that's, ass- that's funny. I recognize the name, but I was like, you know what? That that for sure doesn't sound like he's still here now because I haven't heard that name in forever. So I just yeah, I did a quick look. It's Joe Dillon. Excuse me for saying. Okay, yeah, D- Dylan's the one that fixed everyone's swings. Yeah, John he Malley's brought him the, from yeah. Harper. Yeah, <laughs> John Maley's the screw up um, that messed up everyone's swings. Um, so, yeah, that, that there we go. So we got it. But yeah, Dylan's doing a good job. I'm very impressed with how um, it seems like our pitching coach Cotham, uh, the youngster, uh, Girardi complimented him in spring training uh, in his interviews and everything, and the pitchers did as well. It seems like uh, everything's clicking with him because other than one mistake pitch, uh, Coonrod. Uh, who was kind of a wild card pickup because he has nasty stuff. Uh, he's just never been location, location, location in his career, where now it seems like he's starting to actually get that down minus one pitch, which wasn't even terribly located. It was just, wasn't that Acuna that hit that out? I think. It had to be. I mean, he, I mean, he had nine hits in the series. So. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> like, you don't have to locate so a pitch just, terribly for Ronald Acuna to hit it out. You yeah. just... Um, so I think that was just one of those things. But I like the approach of the bullpen, um, the rotation this far for the most part, and then especially from the top three guys. And then um, the lineup, I think the approach is good. It's just not translating yet for everybody. Like Segura is starting to translate. I think he's at like 235 or something. But he has been very good defensively. I have liked how he's slimmed down. He looks faster on the bases. He's hustling a lot more this year. So he seems the most committed he's been. Um, and then... Uh, I think that'll come, too, because he is starting to hit it the other way. Again, he's just hitting in the outs on hard hit balls mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, so I like the approach. I think for some guys, it's just taking a little bit longer. Where other guys like Reese and Boom, who I feel like should always hit like that. Reese never should have went to trying to be a full up cut uh, 
like male, he made him that we remember now, and then Dylan turned him into his old school self again. That's how Reese should be hitting. He has power to all fields. So it's good to see guys taking advantage of their swing. The big thing that sticks out like a sore thumb in the lineup, you know I like this guy, but he only hit good the first couple games he was in was Hazley and then went into a massive slump, and then Roman Quinn is basically just a statue at home plate. Um, so he's basically just good for bunting and then pinch running um, and fielding when it comes to now. He actually, when it comes to throwing some guys out, apparently, which nobody else knew. <laughs> um, so uh, he's a guy that you don't, I don't know what you expect from him at this point, but uh, we'll see what comes. Hazley's been uh, unimpressive. I wouldn't be surprised if that keeps struggling and they really like the swings of, um, in camp of how in the simulated games and everything, a Moniac or a Kingery looks if one of those guys is up sooner rather than later at the center field job, just stick keeps sticking out like another week or so into this, like a big sore thumb. So. Yeah, and for the final thoughts this run here, I'm going to take the Phillies winning three out of four in this series. Yes, on the road. Again, very confident in the pitching and the way it's going to handle the Mets pitching. Um, so give me Phillies three out of four in the series to continue their hot start run and give me the standout star will be Reese Hoskins for the week, uh, for the midweek so series. Matt Joyce is not your standout star. Though. No, Matt Joyce is not. I'm going to stick with the hot hitting Reese Hoskins. You know, he's my boy. Um, so give me that the Hoskins train again, once again, uh, and Joe, once you finish up here, why don't you just tell us where else we can find you after you give us your series predictions and standout star. Uh, yeah, my series prediction, uh, I don't want to say, there's a chance of three out of four. I just go into four game series, just logistically thinking, um, I'm happy if you split. So I'm just going to predict that I think we're going to split and then I'll just be overly pleased if we do end up doing what, what, um, you projected kind of like I did with the season. I didn't think we were going to make it. I projected us in third place. If we continue to do this well, make it yippity doo all day. Then I'm so, um, (laughs) so, uh, I project uh, that we're split. Um, I think it'll be a very good series, and that'll keep putting us – that'll keep us in a good spot for the division to start the season thus far as well. So it's key to just split this series, and if we end up winning it like you projected, that's very good. Um, I do think the key guy in this series um, will be – it seems like his swing's coming back. I feel like Bohm's going to be a guy that's uh, very pivotal now um, swinging. I think he'll get up with runners on a good amount, potentially, in this series of Reese um, and Bryce, who uh, hasn't been um, swinging it as hot as I obviously I think he would hope yet, but has been drawing walks. So um, I think if those guys get on base, we'll continue to see Bohm have a hot bat. So he would be my breakout star, and I think they're split this series. Um, as for where you can find me, I'm mainly on Twitter, which is – at JJ Borick 26 and uh, you can find my stuff on YouTube, the Sports Fanatic news page we're on now. Please uh, like, comment, and subscribe, everybody. We appreciate your support. And also on steelflyers.com, that in the near future, excuse me, Andrew and I uh, will be starting a show on also. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Absolutely. That- Sunday's the debut. Sunday will be the debut of that show. Well, we'll come out of the name eventually, but uh, most important thing is just look for our show Sunday. <laughs> we might just, since it is going to be, that's all more dressed up um, where we're going to do polos or like something more dressed down. And now we might just, until we come up to a name poll, like the strip down sports hour or something like corny like that. <laughs> and, we'll come, and then we're, and then we're, and then we'll come up with a name eventually, that even sounds- though it might be over an hour sometimes, but you know, close enough. To- <laughs> But yeah, th- there you have it. Look out for that in the near future. Like and subscribe to this uh, video and this channel as well. And let us know any thoughts, anything you think about these Phillies. And eventually, or, or, go check out our other shows as well. Obviously, with a struggling Flyers team, a hot Sixers team, a hot Phillies team. And we'll see what happens after the draft. Hey, we'll the Union won in the CONCACAF, too. It I mean, did. did. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, we'll, we'll see what we game. call the Eagles after their draft. The Union are going to start winning. We all know they're a solid team. Hopefully now they have that playoff experience, they'll have a solid playoff run, and we can expect to see here in the near future. But anyway, that's enough for me rambling on. Again, for Joe and Andrew, thanks for watching another episode here. For this time, the Phillies and Mets preview. Hopefully we can take three, if not four, but at least just get the series split, as Joe mentioned, is what you look for in four games. Have a great night, everybody.